Hey everybody, welcome to episode 70 of the Metal Detecting Show podcast. My name is Kieran, and I have been metal detecting now for nearly 30 years. This week I want to answer a listener's question in that, is a newer detector necessarily better than an old one? So let's get on with the show. Hey everybody, before we start, I want to thank you for listening to the podcast, and I hope you enjoyed the episode this week. If you want to support the show, there are many options available from the links in the episode notes below. And if you want to interact with me and the show, that information's in there too. But most importantly, if you like this content, please don't hesitate to tell your friends and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast. I hope you had a great week hunting this week. The crops have been harvested, so it's time to get out looking for permissions, or at least rekindle some discussions in the hope of some new hunting grounds. So this week, I want to tackle a question I was asked a few weeks ago, and that question was whether a newer detector is necessarily better than an older detector. I believe the sentiment of the question was in relation to a 10 to 20 year old detector versus an Equinox or similar. Now, I thought about the answer to this question quite a lot since the asking, and I have to say, initially, I would have said, of course, newer is better. Hands down, the Nox is the best bang for the buck you can buy these days. No questions asked. We saw the demise of White's detectors because they couldn't keep up with the rampant onslaught of technology in the hobby. I did discuss this in episode Is this the end of the analog metal detector? And even in the dying last hours, there were people who were singing the praises of whites as a great detector. But this listener's question did give me a moment of pause and almost a self-reflection on whether my opinion was well-founded or not. So I started to break down the question into points. For example, comparing older manufacturing materials versus newer materials, older technology versus newer technology, and older features versus newer features. And what I found actually gave me ground for pause. So starting with manufacturing materials, it is no secret that they don't make them like they used to. Stuff was built to last back in the day, with steel tubing and a serious lack of planned obsolescence. Equipment tended to last a lot longer, true. However, advancements in material science has resulted in the availability of carbon fibre shafts, new plastics that are both lightweight and hard-wearing, but also manufactured to a tolerance that allows for easy application of a waterproofing seal, making detectors effectively submersible, but ultimately affordable due to mass manufacturing. So older detectors tended to be handmade to some degree and made from hard-wearing materials and back in the day, hard-wearing also meant heavy. So not an ideal start, but by no means a deal-breaker as some very expensive newer detectors weigh a ton and can only dip their toes in the water. So if I tightly squint my eyes, I potentially see no difference here. On to technology. Starting with circuitry, back in the olden days of early detectors, these were clunky machines that were hand-built using valves, which were heavy, giving off heat and prone to oscillator shift, which resulted in the need for the detector to be retuned regularly. Now it is quoted all over the web that Garrett, along with the invention of the BFO detector, solved this problem of oscillator shift, when in fact it was the invention of the transistor that solved this problem as oscillator shift was caused by the heating up of the circuitry by heat of the valves, which were well known at the time to needing ramp up time for efficient use. But with the invention of the transistor, this circuit needed no ramp up time and released very little heat, resulting in very little change in the circuit's temperature, making for a more stable circuit, and it was the transistor that allowed for longer battery life quicker circuitry and mobility, so it is safe to say if your detector is still running on valves, it may be time for an upgrade. But if on the other hand, it is running on an integrated circuit, such as a microprocessor, then the distinction is easy to make. With battery tech, it is only since the advent of the mobile phone in the last 10 years that we now see the adoption of the rechargeable battery, initially NICAD, but generally LiPo now. Prior to this, the top packed item for a detectorist was to pack a spare set of batteries. 
I remember it well. I also remember the added cost to the hobby of purchasing a set of new batteries every week because no matter how you skinned it, old rechargeable DD batteries never performed as well as fresh non-rechargeable ones. So, like I said, the hobby adopted the rechargeable battery, firstly in form of the NICAD cartridge that you charge on a separate unit, but cost several hundred bucks to get a spare battery because one battery would never last a full hunt. But now we have inbuilt LiPo batteries that last days, which if using a newer high-end detector has resigned the pain of packing batteries to the recycling bin. The funny thing is now, what we're packing is an external battery pack to extend the life of the LiPo battery. So really, we have gone full circle now. So have we progressed that far at all? Other technologies only adopted in the last 10 years include Bluetooth Wi-Fi, allowing for wireless operation of headphones and coils, GPS, LED colored screen, even haptic feedback. Has any of this improved the actual detection ability of a detector? Well, no, I'm not sure. So what are we looking at now? Well, it's simple. Let's look at the features that make a great detector. We all know them. Discrimination, which easily allows for the measurement of the phase shift caused due to differing metals under the coils. Ground balance, similar to discrimination, a measurement of the phase shift caused by the ground and balancing for this. Depth and sensitivity. Depth speaks for itself, but sensitivity is the measure of a detector's ability to detect an object of a specific size. And then operating at a particular frequency as per your desired targets. Different frequencies have a better ability to detect different high value targets. And then you add some sort of display or audible indication of a good target. Now, in thinking about the question, is newer better than older? I wanted to do a quick search of the patents that were involved in the invention of these features. I thought it would take me an hour or so, but it took me quite a long time to weasel out the relevant patents, as it seems everyone and their uncle has a patent on a metal detector. Anyways, there was one thing that stuck out in my mind that really was worrying. Every one of the patents for the above features were filed. Wait for it. Well, okay, Alexander Graham Bell invented the metal detector, but it was Gerhard Fischer of Fischer Metal Detectors fame that patented the handheld metal detector back in the 1930s. But did you know that the technology hasn't progressed much since the 1980s? Discrimination was filed in 1975 under the title Induction Balanced Metal Detector with Inverse Discrimination and refers to a previous patent in 1974 traffic detector using ball transformer phase detector. Ground balance was filed in 1977 under the patent called Metal Detector Systems with Ground Effect Rejection. And Depth and Sensitivity was filed in 1971 under the patent called, wait for it, Metal detector for identifying and discriminating between objects of differing size, shape, orientation and ferrous content and including an auto-nulling circuit. Now, these three patents seem to be integral patents to where metal detecting is right now as all three are cited in hundreds of subsequent patents all relating to metal detecting. What about the rest of the features like frequency and indication? Well, knowledge about the differing frequencies and indication of a good target seems to have been there since Gerhard Fischer's invention of the detector back in the 1930s. So, are you seeing the pattern here in what I'm calling out? The essential features that make up a good detector have all been invented prior to 1980, probably 1975 really. But Kiran, I hear you say, all the new detectors now have multi-frequency, and if you don't have that, you're not equipping yourself with the best equipment out there. Well, what if I told you the patent for MindLab's multi-frequency was filed in 2004, 17 years ago? I actually believe there has been so little in the way of advancements that we saw in the 70s, since the 70s, that it is hard to say that the modern detector is orders of magnitude better than a 20-year-old detector. What seems to be happening is a more of a refinement or tightening up of tolerances of old technology using modern integrated circuits and technology, but the fundamental underlying technology is the same. So, back to the question, is new better than old? Well, 
You wouldn't throw out an old piano if it kept tune, had all the keys working, and you knew it inside out. And that's the same for a new detector. If your old one is doing all the things you're asking from it, you can play it with confidence, then why change? Why take 10 steps back just to learn a new detector when your current 20-year-old or even 30-year-old detector is operating instinctive for you, allowing you to operate in the zone almost in symbiosis with the machine? I have to say, I am not like that with any of my detectors. I would love to, but I think it's simply because I change them out too often. And maybe that's a bad thing too. But I will never again judge someone who is rocking an old White's detector. In reality, there is very little difference, just a repackaging of old technology. The only difference I can see nowadays is the use of microprocessors, which means that the software is actually driving the fundamental improvements we see today. And it is all down to taste. Do you prefer an electronic keyboard or a Steinway grand piano? I, for one, am super intrigued about this. I want to start trying out these old detectors to see how they perform in my computer delicate girl hands. That's it for this week. I hope you like this episode of the Metal Detecting Show podcast. Check out our website, www.themetaldetectingshow.com for this episode's show notes. Check out our Patreon page if you want to help the podcast stay alive or just want to buy me a coffee. Actually, if you want to buy me a coffee, you can do so at www.buymeacoffee.com forward slash metaldetecting. Also, if you'd like to leave me a voicemail, please do so on speakpipe.com forward slash show. The link will be in the show notes and on the website. If you feel like taking your appreciation to the next level, feel free to leave me a positive review on any podcast directory of your choice. If you like this content and would like more, please don't hesitate to tell your friends at least one and don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Once again, I hope you've enjoyed this episode and we will chat to you all again next week. Get out there, eyes down and happy hunting.